Welcome to today's live stream. Today we're going to be doing uh, Security Plus Lab 25. This one's going to be on PowerShell security. So we're going to be configuring things using PowerShell. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of configuration commands using PowerShell here, primarily with Windows. I mean, PowerShell is a window utility. I don't think we're going to be doing anything with Linux in this one. So if you're interested in you know, learning some PowerShell commands or different shortcuts with PowerShell, it's a very powerful tool. It can be used to configure not only your device, but also to remotely configure uh, other devices on your network. So it can be very helpful there. Again, if you guys have any questions with this one, please leave a comment or a chat. I'll be happy to answer it. If you have any questions even about anything else, uh, not specifically about what we're talking about, please feel free to chime in. Hope you guys have a good time tonight. And let's go ahead and get started as soon as this loads up here. And if you're looking for some free resources about Security Plus while this loads, please check the description. I got some links there. You know, we, we teach live classes. We have self-paced classes with Security Plus, and there's uh, free Security Plus training that I offer. I teach you how to get, how to start registering for your Security Plus exam and the benefits of that exam. All right, so let's go ahead. Okay, this is Lab 25, and you know this description here tells us that. PowerShell is a very popular, very powerful tool. It can be used to configure other tools like Group Policy uh, Editor. We could create, so what we're going to be doing here, we're going to create a Group Policy object to manage our logging within PowerShell. And we're going to be working with that notional 515 support company. So let's go ahead. Let's see what the resources are. All we have is DC1. So we're going to do everything with DC1 here. All right, let's go ahead and get started. And since this is a Windows lab, we have those shortcuts available to us. But I really do invite you guys to practice not using the shortcuts practice by typing out the commands. Really gonna, it's gonna help you learn this PowerShell a little better by doing it, okay? All right, so go ahead. We're gonna start by Tools, Group Policy Management. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new group policy object in this domain of corp.515support.com. So there we are. And I think it's helpful to expand that out. We can go ahead and create a group policy object in this domain and link it here. We're gonna call that PowerShell Security GPO. We're gonna hit OK. Then we have a new GPO. We can right click that and we can edit it. Now what we're gonna do here is we're gonna scroll down. Whenever you see this in the lab, it means you have to drill down to that, that particular setting. So we're gonna to go to computer configuration, then policies. So click the carrot, then we're gonna administrative templates, Windows components, and Windows PowerShell. Let me expand this out. Windows PowerShell, okay. So now we have a couple different options on the right hand side. We could log uh, different th in any transactions or any commands that have happened in PowerShell. And we're going to do block logging. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn on block logging. And to do that, we have to edit this policy. Okay. And we have to configure it to be enabled. Okay. Because even though it says turn on PowerShell script block logging, if that's not configured, then that setting is, it's basically off. It's the same as if we were to disable it manually, essentially, okay? So if it's not configured or if it's disabled, the option is grayed out. So we wanna enable it, apply to allow that or start that logging, okay? And then we're good, that's all we need to do. I'm just gonna minimize this because we might come back to it. All right, let's see. Now we wanna right click on our GPO and we want to save report, okay? And we're to save this to our desktop. So just click the desktop shortcut, keep the default name. Now the script here is going to determine if we have that. It's going to default as an HTM file, okay? So it could be viewable in the world's best browser, Internet Explorer. Best browser, that's what Windows would want you to believe, though now we're they're pushing Edge on you. Does anybody notice so how Edge will always show up on your desktop no matter how many times you, you take it off after every Windows update? 
Anyway, I think there's a technical term for that where they're, they're trying to, you know, it's like something creep, uh, application creep, where they just start putting applications at different spots without informing you. Anyway, okay. So now we're gonna right click on the start menu and we could go to uh, Windows PowerShell. I like to do it by doing the search bar and I invite you to do the same. So I'm just gonna type PowerShell because right here what you can do, you know, we could right click on the app. I'm gonna right click on PowerShell and run as administrator. You definitely wanna run as administrator all times. And then, yeah, let's see. You can access it through the, you can access it here too, through the start menu. But you always wanna right click on that and run as administrator. That's gonna give you the ability to actually do a lot of these commands that we're doing because you'll need administrative privileges. All right. So now we're gonna run this following command, gp update space slash force. So we're gonna force a group policy update, okay? And make sure to spell that correctly. If you guys misspell things, just know I do this all the time. I, I still misspell things very often. It happens. Okay, now we wanna run this twice. We wanna wait till we get back until we see our our uh, file location and we're gonna do the same thing. So I'm just gonna hit up and I'm gonna hit enter. We're gonna update the policy. A lot of students fail to do it twice and then they get into some trouble later down the, the lab. And even says there to use the up arrow key. All right, so once we've done that, we're good. Okay, so now it's telling us we can, we're gonna configure PowerShell execution control on the DC1 virtual machine. We, not, we would not be likely to create and test scripts on a domain controller. We're just using this virtual machine to simplify the lab environment requirements. Not likely to test scripts on a domain controller. Yeah, so what it's telling us here is if this was an actual domain controller in a production environment, you wouldn't want to be doing any testing. Now, we could have a staging or a test environment where we could do these types of uh, tests, and that's how normally like a larger enterprise would operate. So we want to do this on that production or or not the production, but the staging or the test environment. Anyway, okay, so here's our execution reference table. Essentially, we have unrestricted, remote signed, all signed, and restricted. And these are basically uh, the types of privileges you can have with PowerShell, okay? So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go to Tools, Back and Server Manager, Scroll down and we're gonna go Windows PowerShell ISC. Make sure to pick the one ISC, not ISC times 86. Okay, anybody tell me why there's some in there called times 86? <laughs> you notice, so Gravity Rice, you notice my misspellings in almost any video? Yeah, it's, I misspell quite a bit, don't I? <laughs> That's okay. I think it's important to do this uh, live, you know, rather than practicing it over and over because most students are gonna misspell it. And I want you guys to feel comfortable misspelling this because it's just, it's gonna happen. In your professional job, it's gonna happen. You gotta make sure that you're, you know, you're able to identify those errors when you make them and you can adjust from them. So don't, don't shy away from it. Uh, all right, so now in here, we're gonna be able to add scripts, okay? So we have the PowerShell ISC window open Make sure to have this window open and not the PowerShell window. So we wanted to have this PowerShell ISC window. Okay, so now we're, we're gonna write in, we're gonna write all of this in here. Okay, so we're gonna do, now whenever we hash, have a hashtag, that's just a comment. We're gonna display the following text. Okay, oops. You wanna write this all out together. I invite you to write this out, but for brevity's sake, I'm gonna hit. I'm gonna go ahead and use the. Let's see. Oh, that didn't work. That doesn't work at all, does it? Oh no, I need to write. You got to do this in the top. You got to do this in the top bar because I'm I'm doing this in the wrong. Uh, this isn't gonna work at all. You got to have your cursor in the top part here. So. Yep. All right. So we're gonna try writing this out. Display the following text. Okay, enter, line two, right, 
host hello dollar sign emb username times 86 uh times 86 Okay, great comment. Time 86. No, time 86 actually means 32 bit operating systems. And that's a little confusing. So it's the older, it's the older uh, designation for what's known as a 32 bit operating system. So we want to pick the one, this is a 64 bit operating system that we're using. So we want to pick the one for the 64 bit operating system. That's why we picked the normal PowerShell ISE. A great comment. And that is very confusing. A lot of people get tripped up. Like, why, why is this, this larger number the 32-bit operating system? Why would an 86 mean a 32-bit operating system? Right host, and then we're good. Today is today. Display version information for PowerShell. And then we're doing get host dot version. Okay. Looks good, I think. Got my commas in there. Get date, write host. Okay. Great. Now we're gonna run script with this green button. I think I'm missing something here. Oh, I'm missing a close parentheses. There we go. And you can tell that works because it matches the colors change. Let's go ahead and try that again. There we go. All right. So now what we've done is we've written this script in using PowerShell. And then we see the script down here at the bottom. So that worked pretty well. Let's see if that matches. Yes. Okay, great. Wonderful. So that worked pretty well. All right, so here's an example of how you can incorporate a script or write a script into your, your system using this PowerShell utility. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to save this script. We can save this. We're going to go File, Save As. We'll save that to the desktop. And we're going to label that as psversion.ps1. All right, we're going to close that out now. And we're going to score that with our script here. Make sure that's, the, that's in there. Looks good. Okay, great. Now, again, uh, from the PowerShell console, on Server Manager, we're going to go Tools, Windows PowerShell. We already have that open, so let's just open that up. We're going to change the desktop, and then we're going to open up probably our script here. So let's change directory, C slash users slash administrator slash desktop. And now you notice that we've changed, our directory has changed. We're gonna type out PS version, okay? We're gonna hit tab, and we're gonna hit enter. And that's going to read this, read this script that we saved on our desktop, okay? So the script that we wrote, remember we wrote that script and we got this output? We can recall that script by typing uh, PS version, okay? Or PS verg, we're just searching for the name that most likely fits, and we're pressing tab and enter. Okay, so we're completing the rest of the name. So we don't have to type the full thing out. All right, so what, can anybody answer this question here? Yeah, no problem uh, for that, correct. I know it's very, that is very confusing. All right, what, what, can anybody answer this one? One, two, three, or four. Which PowerShell version installed on DC1?
Okay, and we'll, how we find that is we look major, minor, build, revision. Okay, the script we wrote has the as a displaying the version. That major and minor is going to be the five, and then imagine a point here, one. So that's going to be 5.1 here. Okay, great. So now we can, we're going to run another, another PowerShell script. We're just going to do, let's see. Should just be able to write, do this directly. Okay, so what we just write this uh, get execution policy. We see the policy that we have on there. Remember, these are our policy. This is our policy reference table. So it lists unrestricted there, no requirements, all scripts allowed. Now, ideally, when you're doing system hardening, you don't want to have it as unrestricted. You want to restrict the number of scripts that can be done on a system uh, because oftentimes malware is run or executed by scripts. So unrestricted is not ideal, okay? Now, what we can do also is force code signing and force only the use of signed scripts. Signed scripts are scripts that are signed or verified using a encryption key, okay? So if we can, that's why one of these options is all signed or remote signed. Local and remote scripts must be signed. Local scripts allowed. Remote scripts must be signed. These are different levels of security that we can have within our system. So what we want to do is we're going to change this from unrestricted to probably, oh, we're going to do this as all signed. Okay. So very easy to do that in PowerShell. Set dash execution policy. And I could just type up and then I can change get to set. And then we just do all signed, I believe. Nope, got to do scope too. Dash scope, dash scope, local machine. And then we're going to go yes by hitting Y. And then that's going to allow it. To, we have some options there. Y would be yes. So we're confirming that we want to do this change. And remember, we've run PowerShell as an administrator that gives us the authority to run this change. Let me scroll down here so you can see this. Okay. Great. Okay, so now what we can try and do is run that script again. Okay. So we'll just click up until we see that. Uh, right there. Boom. And it gives us an error message you cannot run on the current system. And that's because we have that all signed policy. So what we can do now is we're going to have to have that, that script signed. Okay. We could run a different, we're going to run a different command called get authenticode. signature and we're going to specify the file path dash file path and we're going to specify that as c slash users slash administrator uh, slash desktop slash ps version dot ps1 I think I probably misspelled something here, did I? Administrator. No, I don't think so. Oh, no, we just got an error message here. Not recognize the name of commandlet function. That should work. Or that should give us the right error. Let's see. What's the following of that script? Let's try typing it out using the type.
command. Let's see what it tells us. I must have misspelled something. Most likely, because that worked just fine. Okay, so the status at signature certificate is not signed, obviously, because we just created that certificate in PowerShell. Not sure what I misspelled there, but I did misspell something. Yeah, I misspelled, oh, authentic code. I misspelled with authentic code. Oh yeah, authentic to code. <laughs> yep, so I did misspell it. Okay, so what's the status of this one? And it says it right there, status not signed. Great, yeah, thanks for letting me know about that. <laughs> okay, so what we wanna do now that we know it's not signed, we wanna create a code signing certificate. Now code signing is a good security tool. It's not fail safe, okay, some, companies to their detriment have assumed that this is fail safe like solar winds solar winds had malware introduced before the code signing process so they actually were signing malicious code and then distributing it out to all of their customers that's why the solar winds hack was such a huge deal because they the hackers were able to infect all of solar winds customers by introducing the malware before the code was signed so solar winds thought this code secure we signed it we verified it but the malware was introduced before this code signing step. Very dangerous. Okay, but what we're gonna do there, enough on that, we're gonna go uh, type this command in here. I'm just gonna go ahead and click the shortcut because <laughs> I don't wanna waste your guys' time. I guarantee you I misspell something in that one. Now, this is gonna generate a certificate. I'm gonna go through it as it, as it goes through. Basically, we're doing new self-signed certificate. We're gonna type in the DNS name Okay, so you have to specify the DNS, the main name system as administrator at core515support.com. Search store location, we're gonna specify that. And then what it's gonna do is it's gonna generate that certificate for us, okay? It gives us that certificate with a common name, administrator at core515support.com. So now what we can do is we can open that. We can open certificates, cert, manager.msc boom so we've opened this up now we should be able to see this where is this this is a code signing certificate i'm sure it's going to tell us here personal certificates there we go administrator at core 515 support.com that's created today so that's our new certificate that we just created. And we can take a look at that. It's a code signing certificate. Now bonus points if anybody can tell me what type of certificate this is or what type of hashing algorithms used with this or what type of encryption algorithms used with this. Can you guys pick that out? Oh, thanks for all the, the chats here. Let's see, while I, I ask that, let's see. Oh, I'm glad you, you passed. Uh, I'm glad the lab videos helped you pass I know these are the labs are really tricky and I'm, I'm glad you're able to use that uh, those to help you pass congratulations on again your security plus oh, and, and thank you Fabio I'm glad the videos are helpful for you yeah RSA Rivas Shamir Adelman and you can see that right there uh, 2048 bit key very good that's the public key excellent so this is a uh, we're using this for a digital signature, and it's also using the SHA ha hashing algorithm, secure hashing algorithm one. So we have a SHA one hash in there too. And the signature hashing algorithm is actually a SHA-256 hash. So yeah, you can see different aspects of that. And, and if you've been wondering, how, what are those encryption you know, technologies used for? Well, here, here they are in action. So hope that helps. Oh, you guys, if you're just starting your Security Plus studies, there's a lot to get into, and it's a really great cert to get you some good practical experience, especially if you work through Cert Master. I think these labs are very good. Okay. So now we've created our certificates here. All right. Uh, we, have, we have our certificate that we just created. Okay, we're going to copy this to the file. So we're going to go to Details, Copy to File. We're gonna go through this export wizard. Uh, do not export the private key. Now this is a DER encoded binary, okay? So this is a, a DER type of certificate, which is gonna have the .CER file extension. 
if you're confused about this, you know, you take my Security Plus course, I'm explaining all these certificates and the file names. You are going to need to know these for the exam. I know it's very complicated. Uh, they are confusing. Not all .CER uh, certificate types are CER certificates. So it could be <laughs> very confusing. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and click Next. We're going to save that to the desktop. And we're going to name that as Code Cert. Boom. Hit Next. And we're going to complete that, finish that out. Export was successful. Wonderful. And we can close that Properties box. Okay, so now back in Cert Manager, we can right click on Trusted Root Certificate Authorities. Okay. And we could go ahead, All Tasks and Import. So, what we're going to do here, this is, these are our trusted our root certificates. We're going to import one of the certificates using the certificate we just created. So, we're going to go ahead and click Next here. And then we're going to specify code cert.cer. And we find that on our desktop. This is the one we just exported to the desktop. Hit Next. And then we're going to select all these other defaults. We're going to hit OK and Finish. Now the import time process will take a moment. You're about to install a certificate from a certificate authority or CA claiming to represent administrator court 515 support doc top. Gives us our thumbprint, which we already looked at. We're going to say, yes, we want to install this certificate. This is a root certificate, which means any certificates issued branching off of this certificate are going to be trusted uh, because it's the root certificate. So, you know, it's going to give you that warning box. We're going to go ahead and hit yes. And then we can see in trusted publishers. Well, we're going to right click, hold on, and find certificates here. We're going to find that in all certificate stores. And then we're going to go code cert. Not CER. Well, it might just be taking a moment to, I think it's taking a moment to import here. It does say it's going to take 30 seconds. Let's see. Take a little longer than 30 seconds. That's okay. Sometimes these labs run a little slow. Oh no, we're not finding the certificate. We have to import it first. What am I doing? We got to import the certificate uh, before we do that. So we got to go find code cert, open that up next, place that in the following store, trust the publishers, and then finish. Then it should prompt us again, and we're going to hit OK. My bad. Import was successful. Great. Okay. So now we can see that in trusted publishers, we have that certificate also. Okay. Got it. All right. Now, if we do a search, we should be able to find that. I believe. Yeah. And we see that right there. Code cert.cer. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, so we imported it into our trusted publishers and our trusted root. And now we're gonna go back to PowerShell and we're gonna run our command set authentic code. Again, this is a pretty long one. I'm gonna go ahead and type this one out using the shortcut, even though I, I do invite you guys to write this out, but for brevity's sake for this video, I'm gonna type this out. Basically, we're setting the authentic code signature and we're specifying that script, okay? And we're gonna specify that we're using the certificate that we just put in the root store, okay? So we're, we're basically uh, signing this script that we have on the desktop, okay? Signing this script here, the PS version. We're signing this script using this certificate that we just imported into our root store. And now when we check the version, 
or the status, we see status is valid for that script. So we've successfully signed our script using a certificate that we created for this purpose. All right, and now what we could do is we could run this, this test script again. And what do you guys think is gonna happen? Since it's signed now, it's taking a little bit, it's thinking about it. And there it goes, it works. It works because we were able to sign it successfully using those techniques. So now the status is showing up as valid. Great job. Okay, great. So now what we're gonna do is we're configure a group policy object uh, that enforces our execution policy. Okay, so the execution policy we were trying to get. So we're gonna go back to server manager here. Uh, oh no, we're going back to group policy management. Okay, going to group policy management, right clicking on PowerShell GPO, we're editing that. We're going down to computer configuration and policies. Okay, then administrative templates, I believe, Windows components, and then we're going to go down to Windows PowerShell. So we're setting another policy here. Okay. We turned on logging before. Now we're going to turn on script execution. And we're going to, remember, we have to edit this and enable this to make it work. Okay. Oh, we do have to do a little extra steps here because we can't just, we have to specify what we're doing here. So now what we have to do in the execution policy drop down menu, we're going to right click. We're going to pick uh, allow only signed scripts, I believe. Yep allow only signed scripts. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and apply that and hit OK. Now we could pick other things. We could say local scripts and remote signed scripts. Remember that corresponds to our remote signed execution control, but we want all signed. All signed is local and remote scripts must be signed. So that's gonna, uh, that's gonna be allow only signed scripts. Hope that makes sense. Okay, if it doesn't, let me know if you guys have questions. All right, we're gonna go ahead and close that out. That should work just fine. I'm gonna minimize it because we keep coming back here. And then we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna minimize this as well. Okay, so what are the following is the advantage of using group policy to configure the execution policy rather than the standard PowerShell command book? One, two, or three, or four guys. YouTube, Discord, two. Yep, and that's great. Two, yep, that's absolutely right. It's, their centrals configurate. We can apply this group policy to multiple machines. I mean, group policy editor really makes it easy to apply settings or policies to multiple machines across the network. You can assign it to roles. And as you work through these labs, you, you kind of get a sense of the power of that, that uh, role-based access control approach. Okay. Now we can also, we're going to do another security hardening task. We're going to disable remote PowerShell. Okay. Maybe this would be a security control that we have in our SSP. The remote PowerShell functionality will be disabled by all domain controllers. If you see that in your SSP, then you know. Okay, you might have to, you know, do these extra steps. So what we're going to do is we're going to launch uh, PowerShell from Server Manager but we have that running. And then from PowerShell, we're just gonna go disable PS remoting dash force, okay? And force is just gonna force that, that uh, setting. And it's, it gives us a little warning, but that's okay. And then we're gonna verify that by typing in this string, get PS session configuration, Oh, I did that twice. It's not going to be happy about that. I 
Let's just go ahead and clear that out and try that again. Boom. Okay, and there we see our status here. Remote PowerShell, network access denied, PowerShell work slow, authority network access denied, looks pretty good. So which of the following levels of access displayed for NT authority slash network identity, which is these, and we see access denied there. All right, fantastic. All right, now we can go back and remember we did that logging at the very beginning. Well, let's take a look at that. Go back to server manager, tools and event viewer, okay? Now we're gonna find our log that we looked at. We're gonna to go to applications and services. We're going to Microsoft Windows, or Microsoft, then Windows, and then we're gonna go down to PowerShell. Let's see, where's PowerShell? Yeah, 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 we need more time. Well, I'm not even going slow on this lab. Man, I do get a lot of complaints from my students about how fast they get you through these labs. I think they could do with a little more time. They do it because they don't want to, they want to be more efficient with their resources, but I think they've gone a little overboard. We're going to right click on this authentication or operational log. And you can see the number of events here. We have a bunch of events today because we've been doing a lot of things in PowerShell, obviously. Uh, we can right click, we can open this. I'm going to open this just so we can see this. I'm going to save this to the desktop. Let's do what they want us to do first, actions and filter. Let's see, actions, oh, action, filter current log. We're gonna pick, instead of all events, we're gonna go ahead and type in 4100. It's only gonna give us events with event ID 4100. We hit okay. And now we see we only have, uh, events at 4100 which are execution basically these are doing different privileges here it's kind of hard to see like this i think a better way let's go to actions and filter let's take that out i want to save this Desktop. I'm just gonna save this as events. Okay. This will show you. Yeah, that's fine. I just want to show you what these log files look like. Okay, let's open that up. So we can look here if we want to save those log files. You know, as a, a security professional, I do think it's important if you have a system, you want to be reviewing your logs manually, probably once every two weeks. We could sort this by event ID. Okay, so you see a lot of 4104s. We got some 53504s. And we could find our 4100s in here as well. Uh, and there they are at the bottom. So you can see more than just those. I don't know why it's asking us to do a filter on it. It doesn't really explain that. But if we were to look at our 4100, we can see the different, you know, what this means. We can see that some scripts were trying to be loaded. These were errors. These were warnings here. You can see the details of those events as well. But remember, we did this PowerShell logging step at the very beginning, and now we're seeing the fruits of our labor. So this is showing us that the script could not be run because it was unsigned, and that was the warnings that we got there. But then eventually, well, we have one from a long time ago and then one for today. All right, great. Any questions so far? All right. Let's do these questions here. Which of the following best describes why group policy is a better tool for managing PowerShell than individual commandlets if you have many servers? Okay, well, you know, we we kind of answered this question already, so let's go ahead and skip that. That's the same answer as the other question. It's basically the same question. All right, let's do number two. Which of the following best describes why unsigned local scripts might be more trustworthy than unsigned remote scripts? Okay, that's a decent question. One, two, three, or four, guys. Unsigned local scripts were probably written by your fellow employees. They're written by experts and therefore do not need to be signed. They're never more trustworthy than unsigned remote scripts where they're written by people outside of your organization.
Any ideas? See in, see in some ones, and that's right. Okay, now the idea here is, you know, if it's a remote script, it could come from anywhere. Okay, if it's a local script, it's on that machine. So hopefully you're writing the scripts in the machine. Now, attacker, hackers can still, you know, establish a backdoor and then configure, write the scripts on that machine, in which case they would be local scripts. But, you know, remote scripts are a lot more dangerous by default, okay? <laughs> because it's easier for an attacker to load or uh, send you a remote script, and, and just closing off that ability for attackers to do that can be very helpful. All right. But this is very good. And honestly, if you were answering three on this question, I give you kudos because that level of paranoia is going to get you a long way in cybersecurity. You don't want to trust uh, scripts. You should do all signed as your policy anyway. You should be doing code signing. So I think three is an acceptable answer as well. All right, but great job, guys. I hope this was helpful today. And you know, let me know if you have any questions. If you're watching this later, email info at cybercrafttraining.com or just leave a question. And great job. And guys, if you're looking for Security Plus training, you want to get your Security Plus certification really quickly. Now we have live training classes. Check the link in the description. I also have my self-paced course. If you like my teaching style, you're going to get not only all the labs, the PBQs that we work here, you'll get to work with those directly, but you'll get 32 hours of HD video lessons of me teaching you every concept you need for the Security Plus exam. So, yeah. I uh, hope this is helpful. Thanks so much for your level participation today. Great job. Hope you guys have a wonderful night. Take care.